Good morning. Good morning. There, there's not going to be a chime in this hour, so this is your chime. I was waiting on Gwen as well, too, and Stephen told me she wasn't going to chime this hour. So. so good morning, and welcome to Earl Street Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here this morning. For those of you that were here in our 915 service, welcome back. We're glad you came back for the second hour of the Winter Bible Study. For those of you that are here in the 1030 service for the first time, we welcome you. And if you're guests with us this morning, and we do know that we have some, we are so glad that you were here with us this morning. If you are a guest, we would invite you to look in front of you in the pew pocket. There are guest cards that are located there. We'd ask you to take one of those cards out to fill it out and then drop it in the offering plate when it's passed uh, in just a few seconds during, or just a few minutes rather here in the service. We're just very glad that you're here to worship with us this morning, and we're glad that you guys came back from the 915 service for the second hour. For those of you that are new to us this morning in the 1030 service, I've just got a couple of quick announcements. We want to remind you about the social media class that will be taking place next Sunday morning during the 915 and the 1030 uh, Sunday school hour. It'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall. This is going to be taught by our youth, and the class is open to everybody. If you struggle to know how to operate all the features on your cell phone or you want to learn the newest benefits of your cell phone or you're worried about uh, being on social media and, and want to know how to stay safe while you're on social media, other questions and concerns like that, this is the class for you. Be sure and be there next Sunday morning. Again, there'll be one session at 915 and one at 1030 downstairs in the fellowship hall. I know you'll find it informative and beneficial. We also want to remind you about the fundraiser that's going to be this Tuesday evening. It's going to be at Fuddruckers on Woodruff Road. It's for our Earl Street Preschool Education Program. That's our weekday preschool ministry that we have here. It'll be from 5 until 8 o'clock. And we would love to have all of you come out and join us for a good meal. And the benefits go to the Earl Street Preschool Education Ministry. Now for those of you that are joining us for the first time here at 1030, we started our winter Bible study during the 915 hour. And the 1030 hour will be a continuation of that. When we finish and conclude here around 1130, we're going to go downstairs and there is a soup meal that has been prepared for us. It'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall, which is directly beneath the sanctuary. It's free and we invite you all to stay and have lunch with us. Following the lunch hour, we'll have another session of teaching this afternoon. It'll go from about 1230 to about 130 this afternoon. We would love to have you stay and join us for that. If there are any children or preschoolers here in the service in this hour, they are, can come during the first service, excuse me, they can come down during the first stanza of the offertory hymn in just a few minutes. And Bethany's here on the front. She can take them down to their Sunday school classes during this hour. And if you are new to us in the 1030 hour, there should be some booklets at the end of the pews. These are your uh, training materials, if you will, for the winter Bible study. We had them for 915. They're used in 1030, and they'll be used in the afternoon session. If you don't have any available, we've got some here on the front pew in the center aisle. If you'd like to pick one up, you can certainly come, come forward during the prelude and pick one up if there are not enough on your aisles there. Now, if you'll take your cell phones out and check them, make sure they're on vibrate or on silent as we move forward into our time of worship. How do we know you, Lord? We know you because you are the light that takes away our darkness. We know you because you are the vine that connects us to God. Help us to know you more and to live the life to which you have called us. Amen.
For those of you that were here this morning, here's your second chance to put something in the offering plate. Just kidding. (laughs) Pray with me, please. Precious Lord, we know you because you make your presence known by the way you love us and provide for us. Teach us how to love and provide for others like that. Help us to trust you more and not hold so tightly to our possessions. Help us give freely and point others to you. We ask all this not because we deserve it, but because we want to please and serve and honor you. We want to be like you, Lord. Amen. Savior, dearest friend. 
Well, some of you came back, and that's good. And some new people have arrived since we last gathered, so we're glad you're here. Uh, I thought that we might take just a moment to uh, give you a little quiz on what you've learned so far. This will also, this will serve two purposes. First, it will give you an opportunity to show what advanced students you are, but it will also have the, serve the purpose of uh, reviewing for those who weren't in the first session. So Chuck, can you think of some questions? I'll, I'll, I'm gonna think of some questions too. Okay. All right, so let's say uh, around <coughs> what year did John uh, live and die? Around what year? Right. In, the, in the late 90s, was John, uh, what distinguished John from the other 12 disciples, other 11 disciples? He, he was the only one who died of natural causes or old age. He was probably the youngest of the disciples. Um, okay, uh, what did, who were the Gnostics? What, name one thing you remember about Gnostics. <laughs> Black and white, okay? They thought in black and white terms. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And Gnostics believed you were saved by uh, having this special knowledge. What was the one word that you remember and associate with the Stoics? The Lagos. And what does the word Lagos mean? The word, okay? Um, uh, what are what were John's two distinctive contributions to Christian theology? God is love, and Jesus is God. Okay, have you had time to think of some questions? I can come up with one. Okay, uh, <laughs> who wrote the Synoptic Gospels? That's all you got. <laughs> no, no, there's a there's a progression. Oh, there's a progression. Okay, don't let me interrupt you. <laughs> What, what's an event that is in John but not in the Synoptic Gospels? Water and wine, there's a Lazarus. Good. Okay. And what's one that uh, is in the Synoptic Gospels but John doesn't include? Parables, Jesus' birth. Okay. Yeah. Was, they, were, they were more engaged than they appeared to be, weren't they? For the most part. Okay. All right, so now we press on to session two. We're going to really get into some of the meat of John's gospel, and then in the third session after lunch, we're going to finish up by uh, talking about the seven signs in John's gospel. One of the distinctive contributions that John makes to Christian theology is that Jesus is God. And there are several ways that John uh, uh, presents that truth to us. First is in the opening verses, the opening verse of John's gospel when he just comes right out and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John just comes right out and says it in chapter 1, verse 1. But as Chuck mentioned in his uh, part during the last session, John has a very high Christology, which means that in John's gospel it is clear that Jesus is not just human, but Jesus is fully divine. And one of the ways that John develops that theme is by saying that Jesus was pre-existent with God in creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Without Him was not anything made that was made, John says. And then later in John's Gospel, Jesus says of himself things that are not recorded in the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus says, for example, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Or, I and the Father are one. So there are all kinds of ways that John develops this theme, but one of the primary ways that John develops this theme is through the I am sayings of Jesus, contained only in John's Gospel, not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And John gives us these sayings with the backdrop 
of the Old Testament, specifically the passage in Exodus 3. We won't go back and read that passage, but you might remember that in Exodus 3, the Lord spoke to Moses through a burning bush, a bush that was burning but not consumed. And the Lord called Moses to lead God's people out of Egyptian slavery into the promised land. And Moses had a few questions for God. Um, I mean, after all, he was talking to a bush. And so none of this was exactly clear to him. And so Moses said, um, look, if I, if I go to Pharaoh and I say that you told me to let my people go, one of the first questions he's going to ask me is, well, who is, who is this who sent you? And Moses said, it just occurs to me, I don't even know your name. How am I going to tell them who sent me? And that's where we pick up in Exodus 3, verse 14. So when John gives his I am sayings, he does it against the backdrop of the Old Testament story. Remember, some of the people reading John's gospel are going to be Jewish people with this background. And what the Lord says to Moses is, okay, you want to you want to know my name? My name is Aye Asher Aye. Does that clear that up for you? Um, and Moses said, "Excuse me." And he said, "My name, if just tell him I am who I am." Now these words, a yeah, a share, a yeah, Hebrew reads from right to left, a yeah can be trans Hebrew is a very non-precise language, unlike the Greek language. So this is the first person singular pronoun, um, uh, first person singular of the verb to be. So, but in Hebrew it can be translated I am, it can be translated I will be. Or it can be translated, I cause to be. And the word a share can be translated who, that, or which. And then the word a yet again. So this is the Lord's name. It's a little bit of a cumbersome name, would you agree? And, and it's unprecise. So it can mean I am that I will be, or I will be who I am, or I cause to be what I am, or it can, it can have all these variations of meanings. And I am sure that Moses was sorry he asked. <laughs> I mean, this is all you got for me? Just tell him I am sent you? Well, the name became so revered that one of the one of the top ten commandments was about this name. You should not take this name in vain. Don't be throwing around this name. This name is holy. And you don't, you don't take this name of the Lord in vain. And it was so revered that the Hebrew people did not dare say the name. And so what they did was instead of saying, I, calling the Lord, I am, they used the third person form of the verb to be, which, can, which is translated, he is. So instead of coming out with the exact name, they started shortening the name and calling the Lord Yahweh. Um, by the time that got trans, and, and Hebrew is a consonantal language, no vowel points. So that's why I have the vowels here in small letters, because these Hebrew consonants, Y-H-W-H, when they were transliterated into Latin, the Y became a J, the H remained the same, the W became a V, and the H remained the same. And so the Latin word that grew out of this name was Jehovah, which you may have heard of. Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, what are we to make of this name? So the Lord said, just, just tell them I am who I am sent you. What does that mean? Well, we don't know exactly what it means, and that's the point. 
there is this mysterious quality to the nature and character of God reflected in God's name. Some scholars have said, well, I am who I am points to God's abiding existence and presence, that God just always is. God is always in the present tense. I am who I am. Some scholars have said, no, this, this really points more to God's sovereignty because, remember, one of the uh, translations could be, I cause to be what I cause to be. In other words, the Lord is in charge. The Lord is in control. The Lord is sovereign. Maybe that's what the name means. But most scholars say, we don't have a clue what this means. There is a mystery to who God is. The name seems deliberately vague. The name seems mysterious precisely to show us that God is beyond anything we could ever say about him. God is beyond anything any name could reflect about God's nature and character. And another thing it shows us is that God's self-definition can only be given in terms of himself. In terms of God's own self. I am who I am. God does not compare God's self to something else. I am who I am. So the I am sayings in John's Gospel are Jesus' way of picking up on this Old Testament name. The word God is Jesus, is, the word God is God's title. The word Yahweh is God's name. And the word Yahweh is a reflection of the, word, the words, I am who I am. So, in John's gospel, Jesus, John has already told us Jesus is God. And in John's gospel, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Then the way, one of the ways this theme is developed is through these I am sayings that only John gives us. And depending on how you count them, there are seven of them. And as we will see, the number seven is significant in John's gospel as well. There are also seven signs presented in John's gospel that we will get to this afternoon. But the, the Greek words, ego, a me, the word ego, does that look like an English word to you? It's a word that we should all be familiar with. Uh, it's the word from which we get our word ego, and it is the pronoun I. The word me is the Greek word that means I am. The pronoun is built into this, into this verb. So it doesn't just mean am, it means I am. Now in the, in the I am sayings in John's Gospel, Jesus uses the pronoun which is unnecessary in conjunction with the verb meaning I am. And this in the Greek language is a way to emphasize the pronoun. So when Jesus says I am, he's not just saying I am, he is saying I, I am, or I myself am, but the emphasis is on the I. And then Jesus proceeds to fill in some of the blanks. So this, this name of God that was so vague and so mysterious for so long, Jesus has now come to take some of the mystery out of that name and some of the mystery out of God's character. And Jesus in John's gospel is going to flesh out more of who God is.
For the remainder of our time together in this session, we'll go through these I am sayings from the Gospel of John. Like Stephen said, there are seven of them primarily. Um, and we're going to take them one by one and see what they have to say about Jesus, what Jesus is saying about himself. There's a, a revelation going on throughout the Gospel of John where Jesus is revealing more and more about himself. And these I am sayings are direct, explicit statements from Jesus about who he is and what he's here to do. So let's take the first one. The first I am saying comes in chapter 6 in John's gospel. Not only is this chapter the longest in the gospel of John, but it contains the most extensive treatment of a single theological thing. This idea of the bread of life. Uh, the, the geographical setting for this saying is along the banks of the Sea of Galilee. The previous day before Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he had miraculously fed about 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then when he saw the crowd was, was getting in a, a stew and they were coming to take him by force and, and try to make him their king, Jesus withdrew and went off alone. The crowd was still not getting the message about who he really was and what he was really about. Uh, but the crowd kept following him. They kept, they kept tracking him down. And the next day they find him on the other side of the sea. Now basically, they were coming after him. They, they, they wanted more food. And, uh, and they wanted him to be their, their king at that point. But Jesus, in verse 27 of chapter 6, he turns the discussion from physical hunger to spiritual hunger, and from physical bread to spiritual bread. And he starts talking to the crowd in these terms, this shift from the physical to the spiritual, and eventually they say, okay, well give us some of that bread, that spiritual bread. And that's when Jesus makes this extraordinary claim about himself, the first I am saying, I am the bread of life, Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And they still don't get it. They start complaining, saying, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son, Jesus? How can he say that he came down from heaven? So Jesus says it again. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And so again, the crowd starts to grumble, and they say, how can he expect us to eat his flesh? And so Jesus, in his way, he doubled down on it. And he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now to be fair, those are hard things to understand. I think if we're honest, we can understand why the, the crowd was having a hard time getting the concept. We have 2,000 years of theologians helping us understand it. Verse 60 even tells us that the disciples were even confused. And so Jesus explains to them that he's talking in spiritual terms, not physical. In verse 63, he says, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus is the only source of satisfaction for spiritual hunger. He's the only source of nourishment for spiritual life. 
And if we seek our spiritual nourishment in him, he promises to give us this life that will never end. And he'll develop that theme in subsequent I am sayings, the, the foreverness of this life that he offers. One thing to notice in this passage before we move on and the others we will cover to have this uh, is how often Jesus uses the word believe. The Greek verb used here uh, where Jesus says, you know, uh, he says, whoever eats of this bread will live forever. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Greek verb used here appears 241 times in the New Testament, 241 total, and 107 of those are in John's writings. And... 98 of those are in this gospel. This word clarifies what is necessary for salvation. This is how John frames what you do to be saved. Believe. There's total dependence on the work of Jesus. That's what it takes. That's how we partake of this bread of life. Well, the next I am saying... Excuse me, Chuck. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is planned spontaneity. Um, so one of the things I noticed about this first I am saying is that um, this is John's way of treating the absence of the Lord's Supper. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, all three of those Gospels give us an account of the Lord's Supper. John does not give us an account of the Lord's Supper. But instead, in, in John chapter 6, he explains what the Lord's Supper means. He gives us the meaning. Remember we said that's one of the distinctions between the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel. The Synoptic Gospels tend to focus on the events themselves, whereas John's Gospel focuses more on what the events mean. And so when, uh, when John says uh, uh, that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this flesh and drinks the blood uh, will have life. That, that is reminiscent of Matthew, Mark, and Luke who said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Drink this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Matthew, Mark, and Luke treat it at the Lord's Supper and John treats it after the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6. Right. Both a similarity and a difference. Thank you know, between John and the synoptics. He gets the point across, but in his unique way. Thank you. Do that some more. Okay. <laughs> the next I am saying comes from John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As the conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders intensified, direct confrontation became inevitable. The religious leaders came up with a plan to test Jesus and hopefully, on their, from their point of view, to catch him in a theological trap. Uh, they brought before him a woman who was caught in adultery. And they said to him, the law says to stone such a woman. What do you say? And Jesus famously said, what? Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first one to pick up and throw a stone. And what did the religious leaders do at that point? They shuffled off. I was trying to come up with the past tense of the verb slink. You know, did they, they slinked off or they slunk, slunk, slunk off. Slank. They slank off. They slank off. They slunk would be with the participle. Um, they slank off. Um, and Jesus said to the woman, look, nobody's left to condemn you. And I don't condemn you either. Go your way and sin no more. It's at this point 
that Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world. Let's think about a few points relating to this, the concept of light. Light is one of John's major themes. Uh, he, he gets at it in the very beginning of, of his gospel. And, and from this I am saying of Jesus, I'm the light of the world, we can make several assumptions about light. Uh, one, light is something that the world needs. Um, John has already told us that in chapter 1. Two, there's a condition to having the light. That is following Jesus. He said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So that's the condition to having the light, following Jesus. Three, the light brings life, spiritual life. And those who have it will never lose it. There's that, there's that notion of foreverness again, of the light and the life that Jesus gives. Once he gives it, it's not lost. It's forever. As we will see, it will transcend even death. Um, and notice here the parallel phrasing, too, between the bread of life and where Jesus says, they will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The bread of life, and the light of life. Um, Jesus gives life, as he will make explicit in further I am sayings. He's previewing it here. We can also assume from this saying that there is a corresponding darkness that exists in opposition to the light. The metaphor of darkness is used throughout Scripture. In both the Old and New Testaments, darkness frequently refers to spiritual blindness, the condition of a person's heart apart from salvation. Just as the bread of life wards off spiritual hunger, the light of life wards off spiritual darkness. God's first creation recorded in scripture was light so as to subdue the chaotic darkness. And it's fitting that one of God's last acts recorded in scripture in Revelation chapter 21 is the descending of Jerusalem, a holy city, that it says there's no need of the sun or of the moon to shine, for the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb, Jesus, is its light. Jesus is the living embodiment of God's shining glory. The life that God offers. And no darkness will ever overcome that light. The third I am saying is found in chapter 10. Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. In chapter 9, before we get to this passage, Jesus heals a man born blind and and. In that event, the light of the world brings light to eyes that had known only darkness. And after that miracle, the newly healed man gets into a heated confrontation with the Pharisees about Jesus and his healing. And eventually the Pharisees drive the man out of the community. Well, Jesus hears about it and he finds the man. And the man professes belief in Jesus as the son of man. Unlike so many of those who had been following Jesus around thinking they had unique insight into the ways and the things of God, this healed man gets it. He truly worships Jesus. And Jesus responds with this saying about being the gate for the sheep. Jesus had a way of taking the deepest theological concepts and expressing them in simple, relatable ways. Shepherding was an important occupation 
in that culture. And it was a metaphor that people could understand. On an average day in Israel, sheep could be found grazing in pastures and drinking from streams. But once night fell, the sheep were brought into the sheepfold, a structure commonly made of stones with briars on top to be a deterrent to the thieves up, up on the wall. This construction left the gate as the only proper entryway into the sheepfold, the safe place. And there was typically someone guarding the door. So what motivates Jesus to use this imagery of the sheep gate in this instance? Well, within the context of the passage, we see that the religious leaders of Israel refused to rejoice at the healing of this blind man. Instead, they, they were jealous, and they drove him out of town. But the leaders had been called to be shepherds of the people. They had sheep they were responsible for. They were supposed to be responsible for the spiritual feeding and care and protection of these people, but they failed miserably. They were petty and jealous and self-centered, and Jesus accuses them here of being thieves and bandits that harm the sheep, steal the sheep. And Jesus also uses this image of thieves and bandits here to refer to anyone who falsely claims to be the Messiah, to be the door through which salvation comes. Jesus uses this image of the sheep gate to say that God's sanctuary, his place of safety, God's salvation has only one door. Jesus says he is that door. And the rulers, John says, stumbled over his words at this point. But the truth is, the kingdom of God, the salvation of God, the safety of the sheepfold can only be accessed through this gate, the risen Christ. The life that Jesus gives is both eternal and increasingly abundant for us, for those who believe in him. All who desire that life, that spiritual life that never ends, must pass through the door of Jesus. The fourth I am saying closely follows and is closely related to, to that one, to the sheep gate. Uh, in the midst of his discussion about the gate, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He continues the, the shepherding analogy. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And again, he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. The metaphor of shepherd and sheep is used time and again throughout scripture. Perhaps the best known example is Psalm 23. If you know it, feel free to say it with me. I'll use the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In light of that psalm, think about what Jesus is saying about himself by calling himself the good shepherd. Think about these themes that we've heard John start to expound on. Life and foreverness, salvation, Jesus is the shepherd of our souls. He guides us and protects us and 
ensures that we can live in the presence of God forever. And Jesus expands the analogy here by saying he'll take care of us at the expense of his own life. Uh, he he uh, says, I lay down my life for the sheep. He also takes things a step further by mentioning the other sheep, which are not of his fold. He's speaking to a Jewish audience here about the mystery of this new covenant that he's instituting where both Jew and Gentile know the good shepherd and comprise one flock. The good shepherd is the light of the whole world, not just one select flock. All right, the fifth I am saying comes from chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? While discussing his role as the good shepherd, Jesus mentions that no one can snatch his sheep out of the Father's hand. He says, the Father and I are one. And this statement inflamed the religious leaders. This equating himself with God. So they started to stone him. They picked up stones. And then they tried to arrest him, but Jesus got away from them. And here in chapter 11, he gets news that Lazarus is very sick. His good friend Lazarus. And he tells his disciples he's going back to Judea to see about Lazarus. And it's no wonder that they get worried. They, they know Jesus at this point is a man marked for death by these authorities. <laughs> But Jesus knows that this whole event concerning Lazarus is for God's glory. Jesus says it's for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The raising of Lazarus will set into motion the events leading to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion here in the Gospel of John. But this event with Lazarus, which we'll talk about this afternoon, it also gives Jesus an opportunity to discuss his ultimate victory over death. When Jesus arrives in Bethany and assures Martha that her brother Lazarus will rise again, Martha affirms her belief in a future resurrection. That one day the dead will rise. But Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. There's a, there's a, a way of expressing things that John's using here it's like where he's saying God is love. Where a person, God, is so identified with a concept that they become that concept. They embody it. And that's what's happening here when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is so connected with the power over death, so inextricably tied to the power of eternal life and resurrection, he's saying, not only do I have the power to raise others from the dead, not only am I going to be raised from the dead, but I am the resurrection itself. I embody resurrection. Not only am I the bread of life and the light of life, I am life. And once again in John's gospel, Jesus says the way for us to appropriate or to have that resurrection and life is to believe in him. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We hear this saying of Jesus read often at funerals because it gives us hope. Jesus makes it clear here that the spiritual life that begins when we believe in him, will never end, forever. Nothing can stop it. Not hunger, not darkness, not thieves and bandits, and not even death itself. It's worth noting that one reason the martyrs of the early church, or the martyrs of the contemporary church for that matter, can face death so valiantly is that they are absolutely convinced of the truth of this saying. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in him, though they die, will live. And it should give us hope too, both in the trials of life and even in the valley of the shadow of death itself. Well, we have a couple more that I'll touch on quickly. We need to break. The sixth I am saying in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. There's a point where Jesus is being totally rejected by his own people. And as that rejection grows nearer, Jesus begins to withdraw from the public and focus his ministry on his disciples. So they gather in the upper room to share their last supper together. Jesus delivers what's known as his farewell discourse. He's saying goodbye to his disciples. He's pre preparing them for the time when he would no longer be with them physically. They have all sorts of questions. They say, well, where are you going? You know, how, 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 will, how can we get there? What's the way? What's the way to get to where you're going? And Jesus tells them, you know the way. Um, the way was an important concept in the early church. People of, of the early church were known as people of the way, not Christians. People of the way. We've talked about that a lot in connection with the greater way. Um, and in this saying, Jesus goes on to equate himself with God. If you know me, you know my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Um, and so here's that progressive revelation of Jesus. The light of the world, the bread of life, the sheep gate, the shepherd, the resurrection and the life. And then G Jesus is saying, you know God and have seen them because you know me and have seen me. Um, this notion of Jesus as God becomes explicit if it wasn't before this. The final I am saying is from John 15, I am the true vine uh, and you are the branches. And this continues his farewell discourse. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and um, at this point his, his discourse becomes more intimate with them. Talking about how they abide in him and he abides in them. Um, and if we stay connected to Jesus we will produce fruit um, because he's the vine, we're the branches. And so what we do comes from him. We'll leave it at that for now, and Stephen will come with our invitation. It's in John's Gospel that Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Not just to live and eke out an existence, not just to survive, but to have life, to come alive to live abundantly. And it is also in John's Gospel that the most famous verse of all the Bible is found, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. At the very end of John's Gospel, John said, Jesus did a lot of other signs that I don't have time to tell you about, but I've written these things so that you may believe, there's that word again, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so that believing in him, you may have life. This morning we invite you to that life, to believe in Jesus, life that comes through faith in Christ. I will be here at the front to receive you as we stand to sing. Thank you.
joy for me to be able to present to you Deborah Eastman, who comes today to join our church uh, by previous baptism. She comes by statement of faith, and she's been visiting here, and you've made her feel welcome, and she has felt at home here. And so she comes to join our church today and join with us as we seek to live the greater way together. I'm anxious for you to get to know her better in the days and weeks to come, but now we want to give her an official Earl Street welcome. So if you will receive her into our fellowship and do all that you can to help her feel at home here at Earl Street, would you please express all of that by saying, Welcome home. Welcome home. Deborah already feels like she's at home, and this just makes it official. Following the service today, we're going to give you a chance on your way out to get your suit. Uh, don't be in such a hurry for the suit to, that you don't come by and speak to Deborah. Deborah, you can have a seat here. We're going to end our time together in a way that I had not planned to, but uh, Butch and I had practiced a song that I'm going to sing for something else on Friday. And it just occurred to me that this song is, is the essence of what John's gospel is about. And since he already had his guitar here, and since we had already practiced it, I'm going to sing it. It, um, it's one of those songs that I could just picture John writing. It is so simple and so beautiful. And this song has gripped me in such a way that I can't describe to you. And so I want to leave you with this song. It sounds just like something John may have sung. Life has taught me this Every day is new And if anything is true All that matters When we're through Is how we love Faced with what we lack, some things fall apart. But from the ashes, new dreams start. All that matters to the heart is how we How we love, how we love, from the smallest act of kindness, in a word, a smile. In spite of our mistakes, chances come again. If we lose or if we win, all that matters in the end is how we How we love, how we love, I will not forget your kindness when I needed it. Sometimes we forget, try to be so strong in this world of right and wrong. All that matters when we're gone 
all that's mattered all along. All we have that carries on is high.